Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Brian, I'm an alcoholic. Grateful to be here, grateful to be sober. Welcome to the newcomers. I'd also like to welcome anyone who might be new that didn't identify themselves. You're just as welcome as those who do. And I want to thank uh, John and Troy for asking me to speak um, and for dinner tonight. Thanks to the group. Um, yeah, I'm just really grateful to be sober. And, and uh, I guess I didn't get nervous until uh, Betty called my name. Uh, I haven't spoken in a big group in a while. I, I, I live in Arizona, and, and there are a lot of small, you know, you speak for about 10 or 15 minutes uh, almost at every meeting, so um, it's good to be at a, in front of a big group. And, and uh, apparently there was an email going out today saying that I was speaking. My, I used to live in Salt Lake. I just moved about six months ago. So technically I'm out, from out of town. Um, and uh, apparently there was this email going out telling my friends that I was speaking and said Australian Brian is speaking tonight. And uh, I'm... From South Africa, so <laughs> so I told these guys. I said the analogy I'd give it's kind of like um, I was uh, being called a cougar when I was really a Ute, you know. So it's about the it's about how happy you are to be called an Australian if you're from South Africa. But um, anyway, uh, you know, if you're new here today. Uh, you know, this is the best thing that ever happened to me as Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, if you're not new here today, you are new here today, hopefully you won't take anything I say too seriously because um, I might change my mind on the way home and you go to resentment for nothing. So um, I'll, uh, I'll try and stick to the facts. You know, I'll try and tell you the, the truth as, as best I know it and, and uh, my experience is best, you know, as best I can describe it. And, uh, you know, I might say something that pisses you off and, and uh, if it does, hopefully it'll spur you into calling your sponsor and doing some work. Um, <laughs> and hopefully it won't lead to a drink for you. But, uh, you know, I, I've, got, I've, I've got my experiences, and, and I'll share those with you. So, as I mentioned, I'm originally from South Africa and um, born and raised there. Um, you know, I grew up in a pretty nice family. It turned out to be an alcoholic family. I didn't know what, what, what an alcoholic was, let alone an alcoholic family, until I got into Alcoholics Anonymous and... and um, you know, I guess that my parents were functioning alcoholics, whatever those are, but, you know, it never got bad enough for them to go to AA. AA is pretty obscure in South Africa when I was a kid growing up. I didn't know about it at all. Um, and, uh, you know, drinking was just a way of life. It was a drinking, a way, a drinking was a way of life in my family. It was in, in the culture, in the community, and pretty much the whole country. I mean, there was just there was a lot of drinking. And... Um, you know, I had my first drink, and I'm not going to spend too much time on, on uh, what I was like, and um, you know, but it is important that I qualify as much for me as it is for you <laughs> uh, to be reminded why I'm here. Um, so uh, I had my first drink at, uh, I had my first, um, my, my parents would have a drink and I'd have a little sip out of that, so I don't really call that a, a, a true drink of alcohol, but I it did set the, as it turns out, it did kind of set up the phenomenon of craving. So that when I did drink, it was like, oh, this is familiar, and I like this. So I had my first uh, drunk or or a full drink, so let's call it, or a series of full drinks at my mother's funeral. So I was kind of screwed right from the word go. My mom died when I was 17, and um, I was in boarding school at the time. And, you know, my life up until then was probably pretty normal, you know. Uh, you know, I was in an all boys boarding school and doing well and, you know, school and athletics and all of that. And, um, my mom died when I was 17, right before I finished my senior year of high school. And, um, uh, you know, I, so I'm going to this church school and, um, you know, my dad comes that one morning and tells me my mom died that morning and, uh, they send me back to class. And, um, that afternoon I was able to go home, quite a special thing. And uh, so we had the funeral, and, and um, you know, these guys that worked for her probably knew I was hurting quite a bunch, and they introduced me to alcohol. And, uh, you know, I remember having five or six uh, drinks, and they were probably beers. Um, and it wasn't so much the drink that was the that was memorable. It was how it made me feel. You know, it took that pain away, 
And, uh, and that's what alcohol became for me. You know, it became a thing that transported me to somewhere that I wasn't, you know. Um, whether it was mentally or emotionally or spiritually, you know, alcohol just kind of moved me along somewhere else because I didn't really want to be where I was. Wherever that was, I didn't want to be. You know, I wanted to be someone else, somewhere else, or something else. And I, alcohol would do that for me. And, um, you know, I didn't get particularly drunk. I mean, I got buzzed, I guess you could call it. And so I went back to school, and, and I, I really didn't have a, another drink for a while because I was stuck in this boarding school where it was pretty tough to drink. Uh, until I finished my senior year and um, and then went off to college. And, um, you know, what happened for me was that, uh, you know, I, I took the drink and then the drink took the drink and then the drink took me, you know, and I was off and running and I had no idea what I was dealing with, you know. I just thought I had all this freedom and I was able to drink as much as I wanted and I was able to do the things that I finally wanted to do. And, uh, and alcohol, you know, kind of made me invincible, made me funny and smart and brilliant, and at least to me, you know, and... Um, you know, and so what happened for me is I went off to college and, and I got a degree but no education, you know. I did I, I checked off the, the boxes that I was told to check off, but I, I didn't really learn anything because I'd rather be drinking, you know. And um, and it was like that every day. I couldn't drink every day because, you know, I drank until I passed out or, you know, I was a blackout drinker for, right from the word go. I didn't know what a blackout drinker was until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. But, uh, um you know, I, I guess the analogy I like is, uh, you know, I wanted to drink like a pig and act like a gentleman, you know. And uh, so I'd drink as much as I possibly could at any given time. And uh, and if it was yours, it was better, you know. And, um, you know, and so, I, uh, you know, I finished that experience and, and I, you know, I'd started uh, um, destroying relationships already, you know. And um, I was incapable, really, of having a relationship Quite early on, I, you know, the book talks about it. We cross the line. At some point in our drinking, we cross the line. And I believe for me it was really that first week of my first uh, year in college, you know. Um, I'll tell you about two other drunks. My, my second one, which is my first real, uh, when I was really controlling and uh, not controlling or enjoying my drinking, and then my last drunk. So my my first one was in college, and I, I made a conscious decision. I don't know if you guys ever did this, but I made a conscious decision to get drunk because I thought it was a good thing. It was part of the college experience, so you got to get drunk. So, uh, but I never really I'd had that one, you know, those four or five or six drinks at my mom's funeral, but I never really drank since then. And so I went down to the liquor store and I bought a two liter bottle of red wine, and. Um, because that seemed like a pretty good amount to begin with. And so I went back to my, uh, I was staying in a dorm, and I went back to the, uh, back to my dorm room, and, and I got a big glass, you know, like a big tumbler, and I drank this two liters of wine in about 20 minutes. And, um, you know, I remember, I, I remember, because I figured you, you have to get it in you quickly, right? And, um, and, and, you know, and it tasted like shit, but because I was a student, I couldn't afford much, but, you know, I drank it anyway. And, you know, and that was my first blackout. You know, I did things and said things um, that I hadn't planned on doing. You know, that wasn't going to be part of the drunk. The drunk was having the fun and the good times and, you know, letting go and letting my hair down and all of that shit. But it was it was that and a whole lot more, you know. And I, I, I remember coming to the next morning, I said, I'm never going to do that again. And I didn't do that again, but I did a hundred different flavors of that again, you know. And, um, you know, Roger and I were talking about love this morning. You know, is it lust or love, you know? And, um, and like when you kind of puppy love, when you first meet that person in your kind of, I don't know, in your teens and you meet that person, you think they're it, right? And you get that little feeling in, in the, in the uh, kind of that tickling feeling in your belly, right? And alcohol was like that for me too. You know, I, I discovered this feeling and this effect, and I spent the rest of my drinking career trying to get there. You know, and the problem with me is when you drink like a pig and and want to act like a gentleman, you always overshoot the mark, right? You know, it was probably the 14th drink that did it, but I'd lose count at about nine. You know, and so you just keep going until you think you've hit 14. And by then, it's too late. You know, and that's just how I drank. And um, so uh, I. I, I, I Worked for this uh, big firm out of uh, college, but I didn't, I, you know, my life was already unmanageable. I didn't know it. Um, and uh, I, uh, I decided one night in a blackout that it was time to move. You know, my friends were starting to settle down, you know, and, and work. And I didn't want to settle down. I didn't want to work. And I didn't want to do all the other things. You know, I just wanted to drink. 
You know, I remember I'd call them up and I'd say, in the morning, I'd say, uh, hey, you guys want to meet for a beer at lunchtime? And they'd say, well, no, sorry, we're working today. I'm like, what do you mean? You know, and um, and so I was running out of drinking pals. And so in this blackout one time, I, one night, I decided, you know, it's time to move. I'm going to move to the United States, Los Angeles. And um, my mom was originally from uh, Southern, uh, Southern California. And so I'd been there quite a few times with her and... Um, you know, the military was after, also after me, but, you know, so like when I tell non-alcoholic people, you know, I get a lot of this, why did you move to the States? Well, I tell non-alcoholic people, because well, the military wanted me and there's a whole, this whole political system in South Africa that I didn't believe in, which is certainly true, but the real reason I moved was I was trying to get away from me, you know? Um, and so I like to claim the AA Geographic Award. I moved 17,000 miles. I don't know, anyone moved any further? You know, I don't know if anyone else can relate to a geographic, you know, when you're trying to move away from you, but the problem with the geographic was that I was the first one out the suitcase when I got there, you know. And, um, you know, and I remember, you know, so I'd met these two guys that I worked with uh, in a training session, and, and uh, they picked me up at the airport, you know, and, and, uh, and I remember my big concern was that people here didn't drink like I did and didn't do the crazy things that I did, you know. And what happened was uh, within two weeks, I'd hooked up with a group that was doing the same crazy shit that I was doing, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and I was off and running again. And, and um, you know, I, <laughs> this is Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and while, uh, you know, dr what, what happened for me was I, I discovered some drugs, but I'm a juice junkie by nature. I only wanted to do drugs that could help me drink more, you know. If a drug could help me drink more, I'm all over it. And there weren't many that could do that, you know. And so, you know, I continued to drink and, and um, you know, and I got another bright idea. So the first one was, uh, let's move. And the second was, let's get married. And so, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a real alcoholic. And, um, you know, water kind of seeks its own level, right? And so where else do you meet a, a, a wife but in the bar, right? And so I remember this uh, woman, now a former wife, uh, who, um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, she came up to me and I said, she said, I heard you from Arkansas, you know, and, um, <laughs> uh, you know, so I proved that uh, wrong quite quickly, but, um, you know, she, uh, she just seemed the one, you know, and so we got married about, I don't know, a couple, couple months later and my parents flew, my mom and uh, my stepmom and my stepdad flew in from South Africa for the, the wedding, and I mean, it was just a disaster. You know, I mean, it started with, at the wedding. You know, we got, we went to the church, and then on the way to the reception, we're, we're loaded. You know, um, and about an hour late for the reception, and um, and so uh, and what happened was uh, that the the Eskimos stepped out of the the uh, snowstorm to guide us in, and I didn't know that at the time. And what happened was her friend, her best friend at the time, came to me one. Um, one day and said, you know, I can't handle to see what Heather's doing to her life and with her drinking. And I said, Jesus, about time someone recognized that, you know, that I'm not the problem. It's her drinking. And, and so, um, and so uh, she had made an appointment with this uh, treatment center in the area, the area that we lived in Southern California in uh, Redondo Beach um, in, in the LA area. And so uh, on probably about March 1st or February 28th, uh, of that year, uh, we went and met with this, uh, this counselor, this uh, in intake counselor, and I don't know what an intake counselor was. It was just the title that she had. It turned out she was a black belt Al-Anon. And so I, I don't know what a black belt Al-Anon was for quite a while after that. But um, so we we're doing this intake session, and you know, and she's asking uh, about the drinking and the why and the you know the causes and conditions, which I didn't understand. And you know, I thought uh, Heather had plenty of good reason to drink. I mean, she'd had a, you know, her real dad left them at an early age, and then her mom met, married this next guy, and he was an asshole, and, and it just, it all seemed legitimate reasons for me to drink, for her to drink, and, you know, I remember this lady just, she would laugh, you know, because she was an alamon, she understood it, you know, um, she knew the truth, and um, so what happened was, uh, we were able to convince her that she needed treatment, and, and so uh, on March 5th, uh, 1986, uh, she went into treatment, you know, and, um, and, and it was about time, you know, because she really needed help. And, uh, and what happened was, uh, you know, they asked me to not drink while she was in this treatment program. And, 
you know, as it turned out, uh, that's exactly what I needed, you know. I, so let me tell you about the last drunk. So the night before she goes into treatment, like anyone should that's going into treatment, you have a farewell celebration party, right? <laughs> and so we had this farewell celebration party, and, and um, Roger and I were talking to her today about last drunks. If I'd known this was going to be my last drunk, I probably wouldn't have had it. You know, if I'd known what so far proved to be my last drink was going to be my last drink, I probably wouldn't have had it, you know. And so I believe for me that uh, God, as I understand God, did an intervention and said it's, it's time for these guys to have a different life, you know. And so, you know, we bought a, we bought a bottle, a bottle of Johnny Walker Red and a case of Coors, you know. And me and my best friend, uh, at the time, who was also my boss, uh, and the best man in my wedding, and, uh, Heather and I had this impromptu party, you know. And, um, and then she went into treatment the next day. And, um, so I don't know which was my last drink, the scotch or the Coors. It doesn't really matter. Um, but I'm sure glad I've had it, you know. I'm sure glad I've had my, my last drink. And, um, and so they asked me to not drink while she was in, in treatment. And, uh, like I said, that's exactly what I needed because I didn't know, it just it didn't occur to me to stop drinking because drinking was the solution to all my problems, you know. Um, and so I, I didn't drink while she was in this treatment program. And what happened was, um, you know, we go to these groups and we talk about what it was like, you know, all the stuff we do in, in groups and therapy and counseling. And what came out quite quickly was the fact that uh, maybe I really wasn't in Al-Anon where they'd slotted me in, that maybe I belonged on the other side of the fence. And I remember being confronted one night in this group, in the, the family group, about my drinking. And um, I don't know about you guys, but my denial was so strong that I, I remember backing my chair up to the wall and tilting it backwards and so that there was no one behind me. Um, and I was willing to fight physically to prove I wasn't an alcoholic. You know, that's where I was. And um, But you know what, for whatever reason, I uh, I don't know if it was that night, but it was some some period in there, in those couple of weeks, I got down on my knees and I said, if there's a God out there, please help me, you know. And um, let me back up one second so to my mom's uh, funeral. So I, I grew up going to these church church schools, church functions, involved in the church, doing this thing and that thing for the church, and then my mom died. And I thought, you know what? If this is the kind of crap that God does. Who needs God, right? I mean, the worst thing that I could possibly think of to happen in my life happened with, when I'm trying to believe in God. So what's the point of believing in God, you know? And so what happened for me was that day when I had my first drunk was the day I decided I didn't need God anymore in my life. And God didn't come back into my life until March 5th, 1986, when I said, I don't need to drink, I, I'm not going to drink anymore for, for the 90 days that she's in this treatment program. So for me, it appears that there's a correlation between my drinking career when God was out of my life. You know, I, I consider myself a, an agnostic, uh, which is a chicken shit atheist, by the way, uh, because I wasn't willing to go all the way and really believe that there wasn't a God or that I could prove there wasn't a God. I just didn't believe that... Um, that God cared about me. And so that almost to the day was when I drank, was when I thought that I didn't need God in my life. And so uh, and so what happened for me, I was really fortunate. I, I hooked up with some people, uh, in a, including a counselor, and she said, uh, uh, if you're serious about getting and staying sober, go to a men's meeting, make sure it's a step study, and get yourself a sponsor and work the steps. And uh, and so I did that. I found a, uh, the Sapphire Street Beach Group. I don't know if anyone's been to any meetings in Redondo Beach, California. The Sapphire Street Beach Group. And uh, there was a men's stag meeting on Tuesday nights. It was a step study meeting. And uh, for so, some reason, I found myself in this meeting. And uh, I, there was something there that I liked. You know, I, I know what it is today, but I didn't know what it was then. And uh, she suggested, so I'd kind of done three of the four steps she suggested. And then the fourth one was to get a sponsor. And so there was this one guy who sounded really good, you know, and he looked good. He was always well-dressed. And I thought, that's the guy for me. You know, I want to look good and I want to sound good. And um, and so I went up and I asked him to be my sp- uh, went up and asked him to be my sponsor. Well, it turns out he was a step Nazi in disguise, right? And so he said, sure, I'll be, my, be your sponsor and here are the conditions. You go to five meetings a week, you call me five times a week, and you come over to my house, you know. And... Um, 
you know, the book talks about we reached the, you know, we stood at the turning point. My turning point was when he said, you need to be at my house, whatever day it was, at whatever time. And I remember I stopped at the Kentucky Fried Chicken down the street from him to pick up my dinner. And I sat outside his house and ate that dinner. And the committee was going, are we going to go in or are we not going to go in? Are we going to go in or we're not going to go in? And um, I'm so grateful today that I made that decision to go into that man's house. My, house, my, my life has never been the same since. And... Um, I went in and we sat down and he started taking me through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we used the, the 12 and 12 for the most part. And um, we started with step one. You know, really we started with step zero, which is the line in the book that goes, if you've decided you want to, if you have no willing to go to any lengths to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. For me, until I, and he asked me those two things. He said, have you decided you want what we have? I lied and I said yes. And he said, <laughs> Are you willing to go to any length to get it? And I lied again and I said yes, you know, because there was, a, there was, a, there was enough of me that knew that this might be something for me, you know. And, um, and so we started with step one. And, and uh, you know, um, today I went to a meeting and the, the part of the topic was about willingness, you know. And I believe it takes about this much to get sober. And I believe I had about this much willingness. And I believe that the difference was God's grace, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, so we started with step one, and, and, um, and, and we went through them one at a time. He determined the, the order we went in them, the speed, and the timing of them, you know. And that was the first time anyone had ever really done that in my life. You know, I, I ran my life. I ran my life from the gospel according to Brian Edwards is how we live our lives, you know. And um, unfortunately, no one else is on the same book or same page as me, right, as we kind of discover here. And um, and so that's the beautiful thing here in, on, in Alcoholics Anonymous. We kind of get on the same page. We're reading out of the same book on the same page. We might all be on different pages at different times, but it's the same book. And and uh, you know I love that about Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know in step one, uh, you know I, I struggled. With, I I was not like a whiz through the steps kind of a guy. You know, I struggled with every one of them. I wanted to balk at every single one of them. You know we we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. I mean those those are fighting words. I'm not, power, I'm not powerless over anything, you know. Um, I was uh, 27 years old when I got here. I was, thought I was in the prime of my life, right? And, um, I, you know, I could conquer anything. And uh, certainly admitting that I'm powerless over alcohol was just, uh, it, it was a concept that really took me probably to my six years of sobriety to fully comprehend what we talk about when we admit that we were powerless over alcohol. And that my life was unmanageable. And you know, and so Larry was really kind with me. He was really gentle with me on the one hand and then kicking my ass on the other. But he, one of the things he said to me that really rung true for me, he said, if you can't comprehend that your life's unmanageable, substitute the word emotions for lives. So what I, what I, the way I, I equated that was, um, you know, I could, uh, I could lend someone a thousand dollars, right? And, um, with the full expectation and hope that this person will pay it back, right? And they don't pay it back for whatever reason. You know, and I feel pissed off and violated and angry about it, you know? And then the next day I could wake up and get ready to go to work, which is a different story. We'll talk about that in a second. I could uh, wake up and, and get ready to go to work and snap a shoelace, and I want to punch the wall out. How does that make sense? A little thing like snapping a shoelace throws me way more overboard than someone stealing $1,000 from me. You know, and so that was part of the unmanageability. You know, my, my reactions were totally inappropriate to the events that, that were going on in my life, you know. And, um, you know, what, what step one means for me, with, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, was the word powerless means that I have no mental defense against the first drink. It took me a long time to understand that. That my own mental resources might keep me sober for a period of time. The guy in the book stays sober 25 years. On, on his own resources, and I might be able to do that, or might be 25 hours, or 25 days, or 25 months, but I have no idea how long my mental resources will keep me away from that first drink. But eventually I will drink, because my mental resources cannot keep me away from that drink. And um, that took me a while to understand that. And uh, today I'm so grateful that I understand that, that I don't have to do this alone. So if you're new here today and you're struggling with why you're here, you know, give us a chance, you know. Give us a chance and stick around for 90 days. Do 90 meetings in 90 days. I, I was suggested for me 365 meetings in 365 days. 
but let's start with 90 and 90. And if at the end of 90 days, your days not, your, your life's not better, we'll gladly refund your misery on the way out, you know, gladly. Um, and so then we, we went to step two and, and, um, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And, and, you know, for me, it was a, it would, has been a process, you know, and a very slow one at that. You know, I'm a slow learner. Um, and, and that's been one of the beauties about Alcoholics Anonymous. Clancy talks about that, you know, that AA does for me really slowly what a drink would do like that, you know. And so this second step was part of that. It's been a really slow process for me. You know, I came and I came to and I came to believe, you know. And so, I, But I'm the card-carrying agnostic, right? And I'm willing to prove it. You know, I, was, I was willing, just like I was willing to show I was an alcoholic, I'm willing to prove I'm not a, uh, that I'm an agnostic. And, um, but, you know, it was power greater than myself. It's the only step that refers to a power greater than myself. You know, the rest is God as I understand God or God as we understood him. But the hoop was made big enough for me that a, a higher power I could relate to. I could not, God had deserted me, but a power greater than myself uh, was something that I could relate to. And you guys were the power greater than myself in the beginning, you know. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous was because I could tell something was changing, you know. I could see it in your lives. Uh, I couldn't see it in my own life, but, you know, there was a, there's enough of me where I live, you know, my God part, where I live that could see that um, things were getting a little better. And so, uh, you know, and that, that second step for me gave me enough room to jump through the hoop to get onto the third step, you know. And uh, step three, you know, I remember being in treatment and um, people, you know, so what happened was um, Heather went through the treatment center and then we, as soon as she was done, I went into the treatment center and so she's out there when I'm in there, and I, I don't know what she's doing. You know, and I'm a bit of a control freak, <laughs> wanting to know what she's doing. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember people would say, well, just turn it over. What do you mean just turn it over? What, did, is there a switch on me that just says turn it over? No. And uh, so, you know, step three was uh, that's when my Larry, my sponsor, uh, explained to me that step three was about a decision. It wasn't about anything else. You know, he said, there are two frogs sitting on a log. One decides to jump off into the water. How many are left? And I said, well, one. Hey, I'm a smart guy. I'm an intellectual. I believe my own bullshit. And so um, he said, no, there's still two. The guy just made the decision. He didn't follow up with the action. He just made the decision. And he said, step three is about a decision. Will you turn your will and your life, everything you think and everything you do, over to the care of this higher power that you discovered in the second step. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'd reached that point of incomprehensible demoralization enough that I was willing to kind of go with the program a little bit, you know. And I did that. And uh, and he took me straight into step four. And we went we went back to the big book format uh, for step four. And we did the four columns. You know, I'm resentful that the cause affects my and my role. And um, But before we did that, he made me make a list of every person in every institution that had played a major role in my life and uh, made me make the list. And uh, when we did that, he then made me get out a piece of paper and on every top of every paper, he'd say, the first things you have to write is God's will be done, you know. And I did that for my fourth step and, and, and uh, you know, and then I wrote my fears and I didn't do the sex part until um, probably I was six or seven years sober because I wasn't having any sex when I first got sober, so I didn't think that applied to me. Um, cause she and I were separated. And so, uh, I didn't do that until I'd been sober a while. And, um, so I did the fears and the resentments and, and I, you know, we, we went to a Sunday morning meeting and, uh, before the meeting, um, it was on the beach in Redona beach, the same Sapphire street beach group had a meeting on the beach on Sunday mornings. They still do. And, um, we sat down, we faced both our chairs towards the, um, the ocean, and I shared this uh, this inventory with him, you know, and I bawled my eyes out, you know, all this pain and fear and anger and resentments, you know, just started percolating up, you know, and, um, you know, I'd never cried like that, you know, even when my mom died, because, you know, big boys don't cry, cowboys don't cry, and um, and that was, a st that was, that was kind of when I went from being... Um, on Alcoholics Anonymous, in, into Alcoholics Anonymous. I was in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, you know, I was all in. It's like my whole hands in, you know, because uh, I was a little bit paranoid. I thought that, you know, I'd shared this really intimate stuff with him. You know, I thought he'd be at a podium like this saying, do you know what Brian did? You know, you know how, how he thinks? You know what he did? You know, and, you know, the beauty of that is if, and I do get to see Larry from time to time, 
if I went back to him now and I said, uh, hey, Larry, do you remember when we did my fifth step and what I said? And he'd say, Jeez, I, I can maybe remember when we did it. Were we at the Denny's? And I'd no, we were at the beach, Larry. You know, I mean, that's I was so important in my own life, right? The whole world revolved around me. Everything I did and thought was like bigger than the universe itself, right? But here's a guy that probably 15 minutes, I mean, he, it's my, been my experience that it's like you almost need toothpicks in your eyes to listen through, through a fist step, right? You know? And I'm sure he was like that too, you know? Um, the drama wasn't as great as I thought it was. It turns out I was just a garden variety drama. You know, I was nothing special, nothing extraterrestrial, you know, I was just a regular garden variety drunk, you know, and um, I'm so grateful for that today, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, I'm just a grain of beach on the sand, we talk a lot about that here, you know, a, a man amongst men, a woman amongst women, drunk amongst drunks, you know, and I was nothing special, and um, and so, uh, you know, then we, we went on to six and seven, which for me, since there are only two paragraphs in the big book, and I didn't understand what the hell uh, the 12 and 12 were saying on 6 and 7, we kind of just floated right over those and got to 8. And I kind of started balking at 8 really badly. Like, I don't want to do this list, you know. And so what happened for me was I had to go back and do 6 and 7. And, um, you know, step 6 uh, in the 12 and 12, I think it was Father Darling who said this, that that's the step that separates the men from the boys, you know. And that's where the recovery really started happening, you know. I, I started becoming part of the fellowship through four and five, and the recovery really started in six and seven, you know, where I identified the defects of character, and, the, and they'd say things to me like, um, well, you're a defect with no character, and maybe if you stick around, you can develop some character with some defects, you know. And, um, uh, you know, it's kind of true, you know. Um, and so we identified these shortcomings or defects, and, and, uh, and the beautiful thing was that... Uh, you know, just like I, I was in kind of a garden variety drunk, I wasn't responsible for removing them. It was my responsibility for identifying them and being willing to have God remove them. You know, this God that I discovered back in step two. And um, I've still got them. They love to come out and play from time to time. You know, they love to come out and play at home. They love to come out and play at my workplace. They love to come and play out when I'm doing money, you know, um, and because they're all motivated by fear, right? Uh, fear is the, the chief motivator of my defects. And, and um, you know, but I believe that the, at least at a minimum, God has taken the rough edges off them, you know, where they're, they're not ruling my life. You know, I was the kind of person, you know, it was any decision or anything in my life was ready, uh, ready, fire, aim, you know. And, uh, you know, I've got to order a little, you know, a little ready, aim, fire uh, since I've been an Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and so we got to step, uh, step eight. And he had me haul out a piece of paper again, God's will be done, the person I harmed, what I did to harm them, three columns, and what I'm going to do to make it right. And, um, you know, the way I was when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, anyone that I talked to or seen should have been on my eight-step list, right? I mean, that's kind of where my esteem was. And, um, and, and, and so if you're new and you're doing your eighth and ninth on your own, I'd strongly suggest you get a sponsor really so you can go back to step one. But there's a lot, lot of damage that can be done through eight and nine, you know. And so what happened was I wrote the list down and we went and sat down again at probably Danny's this time. And we went through the list and, and he weeded out half these amends that I thought I needed to make. He said, no, you don't own amends to those persons or that institution. And so we, we were left with this, uh, we were left with this uh, list at the end that uh, we'd gone through together. And um, he said, you know, when you go out and make your amends, this is about making relationships right, paying the money that you stole, and uh, amending the situations that you destroyed through your drinking. And he said, uh, do not carry the AA banner in there, you know. Do not spe expect a parade for doing what really should be done anyway, right? And uh, so I went back and I started making the amends and... and um, you know, I'd like to tell you that I did them all in three weeks, uh, but it wasn't the case. I, I, uh, so let me state, my sobriety date is March 5th, 1986, and I can only attribute that to the grace of God of, and, and the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, because I hadn't planned on sticking around. But um, uh, so he sent me off into the big bad world to go and make these amends. And, um, you know, I didn't, make, uh, I didn't make my amends to my um, employer at the time I got sober until I was 16 years sober because I really didn't think I, I owed him an amends. You know, I gave him everything I had to give him, right, which was nothing. And then I didn't make a, amends to um, my best friend from college 
um, until I was 20 years sober. You know, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, you know, I think for me I, at the time, for the, you know, that intervening time that I was sober, I really didn't believe that I owed them an amends, you know. Uh, and, and then one day it hit me that I really owed them an amends. And, um, and I made contact with both of them. Unfortunately, one of them I could just do it over the phone, but he, he got it. You know, my, my friend from college, because he lives in South Africa, and I was there three years ago when I made the amends, and unfortunately we weren't able to get together in person. Um, but, uh, you know, I was able to clean my side of the street, you know. Because I, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm drinking, I'm not a good son. I'm not a good, oh, I'm not a, oh, well, that's the only role I really had in my family. I'm not a good, good son, and I'm certainly not a good friend, you know. I don't know how to be a friend, and I don't know how to accept your friendship, right, other than take, 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 take. And uh, so I was able to go back and make amends for that. And, um, you know, my dad, um, so my dad, uh, my, I was about five years sober, little, almost before my fifth birthday, and I got a call that my dad was really sick in South Africa. And so, um, you know, as God would have it, right, my wife uh, worked for Delta at the time, and we were able to get a, a flight over there. And, um, you know, as it turned out, he was waiting, he was waiting for me to get there before he died, you know. And so, um, I'd made a couple of runs at, at amends with him, but it was always contingent on, uh, from my standpoint of him going to AA, you know, I'm going to make these amends to you and you go to AA and then we'll all be good and the rest of the world will sing Kumbaya, right? And, um, he didn't want to go to AA. Didn't want to go. I couldn't make him. And so, but that day that he died, we were able to finally make our peace, you know, and I cried again, you know, and, um, and, and that's been one of the beauties that I've been, one of the beautiful gifts I've been given here in Alcoholics Anonymous is the ability to cry, you know. Someone told me really early on, they said, each time you cry, you get closer to God, and I believe that today, you know, and, um, you know, you guys have uh, softened my heart, you know, I, I came in here, I thought I was the baddest biggest badass on the planet, you know, and it turns out I'm not, man. I'm a little teddy bear. I'm a softy. You know, I've got a, I've got a soft heart, you know, alcohol hardened it, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, and so to them, you know, I'm a softy, you know. I'm really, I really am a softy, and, and I'm grateful for that, you know. I'm, I'm trying to look on people in my life. It's hard at times, trust me. I'm trying to look, at the, look on them with soft eyes, you know, uh, and with love and, and um uh, I, I've learned that in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so, anyway, we moved on to step 10. And, and uh, you know, step 10 was about, you know, taking inventory, whether it was a written format or just talking, sitting down with another alcoholic. Um, but it was about taking inventory throughout the day or at the end of the day. And then, uh, you know, step 11 was the safety net for step 10. You know, the, the 11th step talks about we review our day. Um, you know, we were resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid. And, um, and it was kind of it caught with I wasn't able to catch if I was doing a ten step through the day and it continues to do that. And um, you know I'm I've got an inventory sitting um, at home right now that uh, that I'm going to be sharing with someone. And uh, so I can still continue to do written inventories. You know I'd like to tell you that I'm so well now that I don't have to continue to do the steps, let alone the written inventory. But you know it's still a requirement for me if I'm going to live reasonably comfortable in my own skin. And um, you know, step eleven was uh, continuing to make, establish a conscious, not an unconscious, a conscious contact with that God that I found in step two. And um, step twelve is, uh, uh, you know, three parts. I had the spiritual awakening. My life, I, my outlook and uh, view on life is very different than when when I got here. We try to carry this message uh, to alcoholics, and this message was the fact that if I worked the first 11 steps, I'd have a spiritual awakening. That's the message we carry. Uh, and then the hardest part, which is why it's the last part of the 12 step, to practice these principles in all our affairs. And, and you know, I, <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I, I, I really struggle with that, you know. Some days it's a little easier than others. And, and um, you know, to, to practice the principles that I've learned in the, in the first 11 steps. And so... Um, so a little bit more about you know about my, about my life. So um, uh, Heather and I uh, stayed sober for about ten years. We both had the same sobriety date, and we you know eventually we got divorced. And you know that was the worst thing that ever happened to me. You know just all the drama that goes around relationships, right? And um, and uh, then I was on my own for a while. And um, you know I'm an alcoholic, right? Anything worthwhile doing is worthwhile overdoing. So I got into exercise and and I started doing triathlons. And you know I do them alcoholically, right? You know it's like 
instead of doing like one a month, I'm doing like four a month. And, you know, instead of training once a day, I'm training twice a day. And, you know, just, just how we do it. And, um, you know, and through that, I, I met my wife, Kim, that I've, I've now been married to for almost 19 years. And, um, you know, she's not on the program. Um, but, uh, she certainly understand alcohol, understands alcoholism. She grew up in an alcoholic home and, and, um, uh, we've had, uh, three beautiful children together. Um, so I've seen, I've got a wife that's never seen me loaded. She's seen me crazy as can be, but she's never seen me loaded. And, um, my, uh, my oldest son, Jack, uh, he would be turning uh, 16 this year. He was, uh, diagnosed with, uh, leukemia, uh, when he was about eight months old. Um, and, um, he, uh, he died from that leukemia about uh, uh, 13 months later. He was 22 months old when he died, you know. And um, what happened for me was uh, that the thought of a drink didn't come to mind, you know. And I can almost certainly guarantee you that if I hadn't worked the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, if I hadn't gone to the meetings and the conferences and the conventions and the workshops and the panels and all the, you know, the business meetings that I hated, I probably would have had a drink, you know. I probably would have had a drink because I learned – when my mom died, that pain, uh, alcohol solves pain, right? And um, but what happened was uh, the people of Alcoholics Anonymous picked us up, Kim and I, and uh, carried us through, you know. And um, the day that he died was um, June seventh, nineteen ninety five. It was a Wednesday. People came and picked me up. They took me to the Foothill eight thirty meeting, you know, and they sat around. And they loved me, you know, and they did that for the next. Well, probably about the next uh, year or so until we moved to be closer to a family. And, um, you know, when I, I went into a spiritual desert, you know, I felt like God had deserted me again. You know, what the hell's this God up to now? Anyone comes into my life that I love, he takes them away. What's up with that? And you want me to believe in you and do your will. What the hell's up with that? And uh, so I went, I, I walked into the spiritual desert and I, I probably stayed there for about two years and, and, um, and eventually I woke up one day and I said, you know what, I can be angry and bitter the rest of my life where I can try and accept this as God's will for me, you know, and God's will for him and, and God's will for Kim and, you know, all, the, all our friends and family that missed him too, you know, it was a hell of an experience for all of us, you know, the, the AA people would come up when he was in the hospital, they'd come up and babysit him so that Kim and I could go and get a shower, you know, or go get something to eat, you know, and, um, and they just loved us, you know, and, um, they, they, they helped put on the funeral. You know, we went to Mexico and tried to get a treatment for him that didn't work and we came back and he died. They picked us up at the airport, you know, um, and, um, helped arrange the funeral. And, um, you know, people out there that, you know, maybe churches do that. I don't know. I guess they do. Um, but if you're not going to church and you're not going into AA, I, I don't know where you get that kind of support, you know, and I, even in church, I, I the people I talk to go to church, get support, but nothing like we get here, and love, unconditional love like we get here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, we had, uh, we've had two more kids since, and I've got a 9-year-old and a 12-year-old, and um, they've been to a lot of AA meetings, and they didn't want to come to this one, you know. Um, they certainly don't want to hear their dad speak, you know, embarrass them. Uh, and, um, you know, but they've got a sober daddy, and that's one of the greatest gifts I've been given here in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. Uh, I'm a sober daddy, you know, and um, I can tell them, you know what, honey, I'll see you on Friday, and they won't have to wonder, now, does he mean this Friday, or does he mean three weeks from now, Friday, you know, I don't know, that's kind of hard drink, you know, you might not see me for a couple of days, uh, and and they haven't had to experience any of that because of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and I'm certainly not, I'm, I'm not a perfect dad, trust me, I'm not, I'm, and I'm far from a perfect husband, I'm far from a perfect worker, but I'm significantly better than I ever was, you know. I show up when the heat's on, you know. I show up when I need to show up, and I show up when I tell people I'm going to show up. Someone else talked about that, you know, and I've learned that here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, it's not like I didn't know about those things before I got here. I just didn't know how to do them. You know, I went to this church school, and they taught me all about principles and God and Jesus and the whole thing, but I didn't know how to apply that in my life, you know. And what I've learned here is the principles that make a life worthwhile living, are listed in the big book and in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and this is how we apply them in our lives, you know, and I'm so grateful for that. And, um, you know, Roger's uh, my sponsor here in, in Salt Lake, and uh, I've got a sponsor where I live in Fountain Hills, Arizona. Um, I don't know, I call Roger probably twice a week. I probably call Jim twice a week. Uh, so I call a sponsor, you know, so regularly. I've got several guys that I sponsor. 
Pepe is over there and Vod's over there, you know, and they call me. And, um, you know, what I've learned here about sponsorship is uh, that's where I started learning about the unconditional love, you know. Uh, that these, you know, these men can listen to the craziest thoughts and the craziest actions that I've done or thought, think I want to do, and they'll just nod and smile and say, yeah, yeah, we understand, keep coming back, you know, don't do that today, maybe do that tomorrow, you know, and, um, you know, and, and they've loved me through the, you know, like Roger and, and Mark know the, the craziest thoughts that I've had, you know, the craziest things that I've done. And um, and what a freedom that is, you know. There's a there's a pamphlet called A Member's Eye View of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know if any any of you have read it. If you haven't, I suggest that, that you read it. It's a wonderful pamphlet, and it was a talk given by a doctor who's a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous to a medical board. And one of the things he talks about in there is that uh, most human beings want to be able to experience the freedom that comes from being able to stand in front of someone completely naked, physically, spiritually and mentally, you know, and he, he talks about that, that at best, most people get to experience it, one or two people in their lives, at best. In Alcoholics Anonymous, I've had it with five or six people already, you know, and there's plenty of, there's plenty of highway yet ahead of me, you know, and uh, what a gift that is, you know, that, uh, you know, I don't have to be what I'm not, you know. I, when I got here, you know, I remember I'd, I'd go to the bar, when I first moved here, I used to play a lot of rugby, right, and so I was a little bit bigger then, and I'd go to the bars with my friends, you know, and, and we'd talk about, we'd, you know, I'd, I'd pick up lines with things like, we're here to try for the Dallas Cowboys. You know, I said, I don't even know what the Dallas Cowboys was. I just heard about it that morning, you know, and everyone, Ooh! you know, and I, I was trying to be something that I wasn't, right? Who I was wasn't enough. And what I've learned here is uh, through, through guys like this, that who I am is more than enough, you know. Um, God doesn't make junk, you know. God doesn't make junk. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I, I've got a life today beyond my wildest dreams. And, 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 and again, trust me, it's not perfect. I've got plenty of problems, you know. But none of them are caused by alcohol, you know. None of them, none of them right now involves a judge or an attorney uh, that has not been, you know, un, uh, hired contrary to my will, you know, or desires. And, um, you know, uh, I've got a freedom today, you know. Uh, I can look myself in the eye. I can look uh, people in the eye as, down, as I walk down the street, you know. And, um, you know, I've got a loving God in my life today. I, I'll be honest with you. I went in the bathroom, had a pee, and got down on my knees, and I said, God, just help me be honest tonight. Let me just do what you want me to do, you know. Um, and, um, you know, I don't have to be anything that I'm not, you know. I'm just another drunk, you know. And someone talked about it. The highest I believe we get in Alcoholics Anonymous is sober, you know. And, um and I'm sober today, and, and hopefully you are too. And, um, you know, I'll just close with this. Uh, you know, if you knew, um, if you stick around and do what we suggest you do, you'll have a life beyond your wildest dreams. You know, that's been my experience. And, and when, the, when the bumps in the road come, we can get you through that sober. You know, my experience is no matter how bad it gets, a drink's not going to make it any better. You know, I, I had a sponsor who's now in prison. That's a different story for a different day. Um, but he used to say to me, there's nothing so bad that can happen that a drink won't make worse. And I believe that today, you know. Um, and, and what's happened for me is that uh, I've worked the 12 steps, and I said this today at lunch, you know. I've worked the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've never woken up one morning since I've done that and I wish I hadn't worked them. You know, I've never woken up one morning since I've been sober and wish I'd had a drink the night before, you know. And, um, and I've, got a, I've got a life today that's pretty good, and it's because of people like you in rooms like this. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.